almost all creators online businesses find this like you're getting from zero to one is the hardest thing of all mm -hmm. because nothing exists you have to perform a magic trick basically that's the hardest work you'll ever do that's ollie richards the genius behind the 10 million dollar online education business story daddy in this episode ollie reveals the exact marketing strategy that makes him millions every single year rather than have a model in your sales and marketing where the whole aim is to sell somebody on something now. Let's sell someone something cheap now and then escalate them to your highest price thing. Yeah. Well, what if instead of doing that, you say, look, we have a journey you can go on. What most people get wrong about building an audience. We have over a million visitors a month on the blog. We have podcasts with millions of downloads a month. You must be doing something right with content. The number one thing you've got to do. And the harsh truth that most entrepreneurs don't have an answer for. Because if you keep pushing, if nothing is ever enough for you and you grow bigger and bigger and bigger but you still want more and more and more you wake up one morning and you think i don't want to check my email today i don't want to do this today ollie is one of the smartest people i know he shared so much value i really hope you enjoy it if you do please subscribe let's dive in so ollie you run a 10 million dollar education business with 50 percent profit margins fully bootstrapped you work about six days a month how do you feel when you think about that? I'm used to saying it now, I guess, but I mean, the funny thing is, it's one long incremental journey. You know, it's not yeah. something that just lands in your lap. And I think, uh, you know, often when you, I was thinking about this recently, when you, when you use, when you talk about big numbers to someone who's just getting started, it seems like, okay, when I get there, every life will be good. Everything will be, will be, will be fine. Yeah. In reality, you know, you, you, you solve problems in life and you replace them with others and you know you want more things you want new things you have bigger ambitions so you know life goes on and it changes and, and adapts so yeah I mean I certainly feel um, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of satisfaction and pride around that but I'm, you know I'm just I'm just getting started yeah I was reading this the other day and I was like that sounds pretty damn good <laughs> um, and yeah it just sounds insane and I think basically con congratulations. Thank you. Um, and the good news for anyone who's listening or watching to this is that you've pretty much documented the whole thing um, and written it, some really amazing guides and blog posts um, on that. And so I'd love to use this podcast as a way to like dive into all of that. Yeah, and absolutely. The lessons maybe of like how to create such a phenomenal business if you're a, a creator or a creative. Um, but maybe let's start with how did you get into this? Because you uh, didn't start out um, going into business straight away. Did no, you? business was, was um, I'd always kind of been interested in doing my own thing, but, but I didn't know the first thing about business. Um, so, you know, I've had a series of seven year careers. So I started my, my, my first career as a, as a jazz musician. I went to a music college in London, uh, studied jazz, played jazz professionally, I played the piano uh, for, for many years, eventually kind of fell out of love with, not, not with the jazz, but with the, the lifestyle and, and, the, and, and the, the kind of job. And then I decided to totally change. So I did an English teaching qualification and then I moved to Japan to teach English. So then I spent seven years teaching English, during which time I, uh, I moved to Qatar in the, in the Middle East, uh, where the World Cup just was, and then to Egypt. And then uh, during that time, during that whole that whole period of my twenties and thirties, the the kind of the thing that I really loved was learning languages. I just ever since I moved to to London to go to to music college, I just loved meeting people from different places. So I just learned languages. Um, you know, I taught myself eight languages over that that time period, and and then towards the end of my kind of English teaching career, I I, I just started feeling really restless, and I had this need to to just create again, because I was basically a middle manager by that point. I was managing teachers. It wasn't fun. Mm -hmm. I had this need to create. So I just started one day, I actually read a book called The $100 Startup by Chris Gillibo. Great book. And in that book, he talked about uh, another guy, Benny Lewis, who had a, a language blog. And he basically traveled the world uh, blogging about languages and made a full-time income. And I thought, that, that's pretty cool. I can do that. And so I did. I just kind of went. I went to a cafe that that weekend in Qatar. I started a, a a blog, started writing about my experience learning languages, and that's when it all 
you know, kicked off. Yeah. So I did that for a couple of years and then eventually quit my English teaching work, moved back to London and went full time on the, on the blog. What gave you the confidence to go full time on the blog? Did, had it started generating revenue at that point or? It was making a bit. It was making, you know, maybe a couple of thousand a month. It was not enough really to get by in London. Uh, the main reason was that my daughter was born uh, in 2015 and we didn't want to bring her up in Cairo. Mm -hmm. Nothing against Cairo. Yeah. It's just not where I want to raise, uh, you know, start a family. So, um, so I thought, well, you know, I was boxed into a corner, basically. We had to go back home. It was the only choice. And and I thought, well, I've got this, this, this website. It's clearly got some potential. It's making a couple of thousand a month. What are the, like, what, what are the percentage chances that I can, that there's, that there's no future in this, that like I can't grow this at all? And mm -hmm. I thought, nah, it doesn't sound, doesn't sound likely. So I, I, I may as well knuckle down and, you know, see, see what I can do with it. Yeah. And how is it making revenue at this point? It's, it's like through ads or it's through no, teaching? A big or? mix of things. So it was uh, some affiliate offers. So I, I, I was kind of following the classic blogger mm -hmm. playbook, which is you blog, you guest blog, you generate traffic to your website, you collect emails, you build an email list, you build a relationship with the email list around your niche, and then you make offers available to them. Uh, and so in my case, it was uh, affiliate offers for other people's products. And then I started making my own little products here and there, little eBooks and, and things like that. And I'd also self-published a couple of books by that point as well. So it was kind of a just mishmash of a bunch of different kind of online hacky bloggy things. Yeah. And, you know, all together that kind of just cobbled together that, that, that revenue. Yeah. So that gives you the confidence. I've got something that seems to be working here. It's generating a couple of thousand a month. Yeah. That's enough to go all in on it. What's the evolution from that point to where we are today? You know, when you look at, when, whether you look at like website traffic, email list, um, whatever revenue, whatever metric you look at, it's one long, smooth, straight line. Mm -hmm. at, the, at any moment in time, there are like ups and little blips. Yeah. You think, oh, maybe this is the start of something big. It wasn't. It was just like one long, one long straight line. So, you know, it's a, it's kind of a boring story really. Uh, and it's just, it is a, it's just a case of, so, so my golden rule with business is do more of what's working. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially the mantra that I followed for the last 10 years. So we were getting website traffic that was growing our email list that was, uh, making, making sales. Cool. How do we do more of that? Write more blog posts, get more traffic. Uh, and then when it, got to the point where I couldn't do that myself, then I'd hire someone to help part-time just writing up the, the blog posts, publishing them on, on WordPress. And then, um, so we started to sell more products and then I've got too many emails to deal with. So I hire the customer support person. And then we realize, okay, we've got a cool product here. Uh, it's in one language. How about we make that in another? So I have to find someone that teaches that language because I don't speak that language. And so we're just kind of adding a couple of people a year um, experimented with new things, adding new traffic sources. And, you know, like with most things, it's snowballs and snowballs and snowballs. And then you kind of just reach this, this, this critical mass. And the interesting thing that happens when you get to kind of higher levels is that if you can, if you can generate a 10% boost in something, mm -hmm. that's actually now a really meaningful number. Yeah. If you're making a million and you, engineer a 10% boost, that's an extra 100,000 a year. Yeah. So small changes start to make a much bigger impact. And so, you know, like almost all creators, online businesses find this, like you're getting from zero to one is the hardest thing of all mm -hmm. because nothing exists. Like you have to do, you have to perform a magic trick. Basically you have to, you have to, you have to take something that doesn't exist in the world, has no right to exist in the world, is not there. And then you have to, fashion it from nothing, shape it, put it out in the world, make it successful. That's the hardest work you'll ever do. From there on in, it's mostly just a case of learning how to be a business owner. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's a whole topic in, in and of itself. Yeah, and I think we'll get into that and the, the various le key like levels and learnings that you have from that. But I'm, I'm curious, in terms of the the main driver of your business of revenue yeah. now is, is courses, right? 
It's a mix of things. So we, we, we sell lots of courses. I mean, our main products uh, in the language business are language courses. So if you yep. want to learn French, we have levels one, level two, level three, level four, all, all that stuff. Uh, and then we also have uh, we also have a certification program where we train people to teach languages. We have about 150 books, mm -hmm. some of which are published uh, in in shops. Others are self published. So the main driver, the main revenue is is our courses. But because of the amount of stuff we do, it's like there are substantial other bits and pieces going on. Yeah, and if we were kind of like mapping out the the business, it would be you like you have a blog yeah you have a youtube channel yeah you have some other revenue sources and they send people to an email list and then that email list sells them these various different products and and courses is that how, how does that roughly kind of break down yeah and map so out? so i mean in terms of so we have actually seven different parts to our marketing mm -hmm. we have organic content we have referrals we have books we have uh, affiliates we have media we have influencer marketing and paid ads yeah so seven different parts to that so in really simple terms, we use organic content, um, affiliates, paid traffic, influencers to send people to us. And then either they make sales directly or then we nurture those people, form the relationship and, and then make sales. It's more complicated than that, but that's the kind, of, uh, the kind of crude version. Yeah. And I think that's such a good point to maybe we dive into... Your how many how many chapters are there in the in the in the Bible of this business? So They've written this is the, the case study. There are ten chapters over one hundred and twenty pages. Yeah, and this is by the way, this is absolutely amazing document. Anyone who's listening, watching this, go to Ollie Richards's website and download this. It's like a, it's just an amazing document and so much value. It's also quite very well written. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's also a genius like lead magnet, I guess, for your for your email list. Yeah, so to be clear, this is not this is it's, this is separate from the language business. Yeah. So my this is OllieRichards.co, where I basically kind of write about uh, you know online business. And as part of that, you know, when I was, when I was starting that, I I kind of thought because I I really hate the online business guru world. Yeah, I, you know, marketers ruin everything. And I think for quite a few years, I've had people sort of asking me for for tips and things like that. And I've never wanted to go down this route because I just didn't want to be associated with that. So when I was starting it, I thought, well, what could I do that would just be different? And then I thought, well, the biggest asset that I actually have is my credibility from my main business. So how about I just explain how that all works in, mm -hmm. like, in you know, uh, explicit detail? Because that way there's no room for BS that way. Like, it's yeah. just, it is what it is, it's all laid out. And so, um, and so, yeah, so I just basically sat down, mapped it out into, into 10 different parts from marketing to sales, to team building, to, to uh, actually, you know, mindset and psychology for the business owner. And just, yeah, basically took everything I'd learned building story learning for the last 10 years and just <laughs> put it all in one big Google Doc. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's like, I've, I've read it, I've read it once, but I, I, I've, I think I'm going to almost print it out and... <laughs> um read for it like again and have it as like a, t a textbook um it starts with crafting the magic your business dna um and basically your usp yeah and you, your business story learning has an amazing usp how did you get to that place and and what what is it yeah how so, do you think about it? so crafting the magic the the idea here is that every the, the, in every space in every niche you have a lot of people competing and but most people really compete very badly. It's like most people just kind of create me too products of some kind. So you know, like another yeah, in the in the language space, you walk into any bookshop, you've got hundreds of books, like you just get snow blindness. And so the number one thing you've got to do in any niche is to figure out how you differentiate yourself from everyone else. And there's this word positioning, people kind of get gets thrown around. But the th the thing about positioning is positioning is what you, is what people think about your business in comparison to all the other businesses that are out there, right? So it so with our business story learning, we teach languages through stories. And that's the that's 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 the hook, that's the magic, and it's also how we do it, right? We in our courses it is quite a different way of learning to what you might be used to on Duolingo or something like that. And so um what we've done is we've crafted this whole world where we talk about uh, languages and language learning through stories 
and then we also create the stories that people can use to practice and all of the different courses we have are all taught through stories. And so that's the kind of DNA of the brand. But then in our content, when we were doing podcasts or YouTube videos or, um, or the blog or writing books or, or, or whatever, every piece of content we put out also centers around stories. So what we're, essentially what we're doing is crafting this real, this really strong USP and then just embedding that in absolutely everything that we do. And so it gets to the point where people have no, ch anyone who's looking at language learning material at all, like they have no choice but to associate us with learning languages through stories. And so it just creates this very strong positioning that makes it kind of hard to, hard to forget. Um, and also just gives people a reason to, you know, just try something a bit different. How long did that take to come up with? Because when I hear it, it, everything makes sense. Yeah. And when I, when I hear, hear it and look at your content, I can see how it just makes all of your content creation, everything you do so yeah. much easier because you've got that lens yeah. of this is our USP. That's how we would do everything. Yeah. But like these things don't happen overnight. They don't. And the, so, I mean, the funny thing is that I've been learning, I've been using stories to learn languages for long before I actually started the, the, the blog or I even started teaching languages. I mean, all, the first time I used stories, I mean, I remember when, when I was learning uh, you know, French and Spanish back in the day. I just buy these books and I you know, just devour the, these books and that's how, how I would learn. Um, but I didn't put two and two together when I first started. It, 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 like you say, in retrospect, everything's so damn obvious, isn't it? Yeah. But, you know, I remember like when I first started blogging, I bought a couple of courses on how to blog. And, you know, at the beginning of those courses, they would all be, you know, what's lesson one in any course on marketing is like, what's your USP? So, hmm, I don't really know. Skip, go to the next bit, go to the fun stuff. Yeah. And everyone does that. But, uh, but I, I just couldn't really think of, um, I, I couldn't, I just didn't have a clear concept of what I was doing at the time. And so it was over a period of like four or five years that I was just trying all these, these things out. At one point I started releasing these books of short stories because it was kind of, I think I, because of my experience, I was just naturally drawn to that. So I did it. People loved it. And I thought, okay, hang on. No, I see what's going on. And then it took another few years after that to sit. Cause the, so the books worked out, but then the stuff that we were selling in the business wasn't related to that. So we had to re-engineer the entire business around stories. And that kind of culminated in a, in a, in a complete rebrand and, uh, you know, changing, we had to do a 301 domain redirect. Um, which is basically when you permanently change the name of your website. It's terrifying because you risk losing all of your traffic. Mm -hmm. Did all of that. And that was at the seven-year mark. So it took seven years. Uh, I feel like such an idiot looking, like, <laughs> look, looking back on it. Now. But it took seven years to kind of get all this straight, figure it out, and then have the confidence to actually then move and double down. But it's no coincidence that that's when the business really exploded because suddenly now everything was centered around that. The brand was story learning, the courses were story learning, our domain was, we even trademarked story learning. And so it kind of just, it just goes to show, and this is like really when I really understood the power of this stuff, when you have this clear brand and everything you do revolves around it, it just puts you in a different league yeah. to everybody else. Yeah, it's um, it, it's so powerful. I've, I've been listening to a lot of Alex Hormozzi recently. And yeah, who hasn't? I've, yeah, I mean, and I think he just, he, he, he has made me think a lot about this recently. And tonight you're hosting a dinner for, for some entrepreneurs in London. Yeah. And even going to that, I'm thinking, how do I describe myself yeah, and what I do? <laughs> and I think there's a big lesson in there in that it actually can be quite painful to, yeah. to, to, to realize actually, yeah, that is our USP. It's not what we've been telling people for a little while or these other things it, like this is our USP and this is really compelling. Um, so anyone who's listening to this, I think like, yeah. And it can take a while to uncover it as well, because, you know, like, like, like I said, in, in, in the pathway that I took. So when I first wrote my book, my first book of short stories, which I wrote at my mum's kitchen table, uh -huh. you know, in, in during my summer, summer holiday, sort of st stuck it up on Amazon, self-published it, didn't think anything of it. Like this was a little side project to see if something would work. It was only because of those little side projects that I was doing that, that, that I'd throw enough spaghetti against the wall to see what would actually stick. And, and ultimately what sealed it for me was the fact that 
okay, I'd made that thing, but my audience also responded massively to it mm-hmm. in a way they hadn't before. And, you know, like the way that we, we began this, this conversation, do more of what's working. Like if you're paying attention to green shoots, then that can be enough just to kind of guide you towards incremental improvements. And then you get to the point where those 10% improvements start to become really quite something. Yeah. Um, the next kind of section here is the product ecosystem. Selling within an ecosystem and your different offers. How do you think about that? Because when I read this, I thought this is an amazing concept. So the, the work that I do now with, 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 with business is based on education businesses, right? So what, what I try and do is, is, is speak to people who, who own education businesses of some kind, because there are so many people out there who are teaching something, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's like copywriting or, or, or languages or um, teaching people to pass their, their private pilot license uh, or, or whatever. So many people are teaching teaching stuff. It's the new economy, really. So this is a, a an idea that I'd kind of been working working on over time, and it doesn't apply to all businesses in different different spaces. But in the education space, it's based on the idea that when you're learning something, you you typically have a different experience as a consumer to say if you're buying a watch or if you're buying supplements. Um, where you kind of know what the thing is, you want it, it's very transactional, right, done. If someone wants to learn a foreign language, for example, it's, what, what, are, we, what are we dealing with? It's probably been a pipe dream for like 10 years. You, you've got, you, there's loads of different methods out there, different apps. You don't know which is best for you. You're gonna try something out, try something over here, try something over here. Uh, good courses or like courses with a teacher can be really expensive. So, you know, you might not want to sign up to a teacher that's charging you 50 pounds an hour for, for lessons and maybe you don't have quite have time. So the point is, it's not a cut and dry. You know, I went on Amazon this morning and I bought, I bought some magnesium supplements. Yeah. I wanted them. Like, it took me five seconds. Yeah. But if I want to sign up to, to a course to help me pass my air law exam for my PPL, I'm going to look around. I'm going to take some time and, I'm, and I might not be ready right now. So, so much of, of, online, of online business and marketing is kind of all engineered around this idea of like, sell somebody now. And that's like a bad idea at the best of times to win confidence. But the thing with education businesses is that what you really stand to get, the big opportunity for the, for, the, for, the, for the education business owner is to understand that the student is not just going to be learning with you for five minutes or even five weeks, but potentially five years. We have students at Story Learning who have been learning their language or multiple languages for five, ten years with us, and they continue to do so. So all of which is to say that rather than, uh, rather than have a, a model in your sales and marketing where the whole aim is to sell somebody on something now, which is kind of the concept of a value ladder, if you've heard of this. So it's, it's the idea that let's sell someone something cheap now and then escalate them to your highest price thing. Yeah. Well, what if instead of doing that, you say, look, we have a journey you can go on and that has lots of different products and you might even kind of want to take a break halfway and then, you know, go off and try this other thing that we have and then come back to us later. This is the ecosystem. So in our ecosystem, we have thing, everything from kind of courses to books to all the free content that, that, that we create. And, you know, our, our courses come in, so if you're learning French, you have like six different levels. So you kind of, you can do level one and then maybe take a break and go to level two. Um, and the idea is that if you create an ecosystem that's bound together with your, your USP that makes it unique, then you create this environment where people who have become fans of what you do can just dabble over the course of, of years at their own pace and continue to, to buy from you during that time. So it's it's a it's a much more like if you're an educator it's a much more enjoyable way of doing business because you're not just trying to squeeze every last drop out of the blood out of the stone it, it it's, this is where the business model lines up with your ethos as a teacher and what you're actually trying to do to help people it's in full alignment that way and so that's that's kind of how I like to build stuff yeah and this is just, I mean, basically everything that's wrong with online marketing and a lot of culture nowadays is like, get rich quick, sell people on something immediately, 
spin up a drop shipping page, some Facebook yeah. ads, make a load of money overnight and then shut the thing down in two weeks time or whatever. I, whereas this is the complete opposite of that. And it, it's, 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 it's so refreshing to me because, because it makes so much more sense. And over the long run, long run it, it, it creates quite a, a really sustainable, profitable business. Yeah. The, the caveat is that within this kind of nice, fluffy, shiny yeah. ecosystem thing that I've described, to make it work, you do have to have the fundamentals of sales and marketing sure. inside that. So, for, you know, just to give you an example, like it's all very well making, having 20, 30 products available, but if you never have any kind of deadline or, or urgency, people will just be like, oh, I'll just buy it tomorrow. And your whole business model falls apart. So you have to create events um, and and uh, and opportunities and reasons why inside your business to actually to actually get people to, to take action on stuff. Sure. So you, 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 it's it's not just a case of of saying oh people can buy whenever they want. Yeah. It, it, that is the case. Yeah. But you've also got to have some some rigor within your within your marketing systems to make it to make it work. Yeah. But I do also I just I I like that idea and that again it's like a framework a way of thinking is like create an ecosystem here where someone can come in and they can spend uh, like several years with you. Yeah. And when, it, when they're ready and you present them an offer that's relevant, they'll purchase and you'll profit. And then maybe like, again, through those, 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 that ecosystem and the years that they're with you, they purchase several times. Um, but it's, yeah, that thinking, thinking long-term and also not thinking like you instantly need to sell someone or something. You can yeah. let them come into your world and, and, um, and you generate that relationship and trust and they really like what you're doing and they, they feel confident in, in you providing quality information. And then so when the time does come that you present an offer, they're like, yeah, absolutely, I'm going to pay for that. You know, a, a mentor of mine uh, called this when he was when we were talking about this before, he described it as day trading versus value investing. And it's exactly that. So much like in one of the, the, the interesting things about the the world of business is that there are so many um, vendors, agencies, consultants that help businesses do things, and you need those people. But the incentives in so much of the the incentives so much of the time are for agencies and vendors to get results for you now, in order to demonstrate their ability, so that you will keep hiring them. Mm. And so, in, in lots of cases you find that people kind of gravitate towards, right, how do we get a quick win now? How do we sell something now? Because that's the way that they stay in business. And so it's good to be aware of that because for many businesses like the way that we're describing this now, it's not the case that what makes most sense for you is to try and be really aggressive and sell something now. But, you know, you can actually do far better by aligning your business model with what your customer's, your customer's behavior and then um, you know you'll do much better in the long run, which makes it you know yes more profitable, also more rewarding, and students will get better results and they'll learn more as well. But it can be quite difficult. Like it, it took a long time for me as business owner to have the confidence to say that when I often get kind of pushed from different courses to kind of you know, do this and do that, and do this. There is a it, you you do kind of have to develop your own confidence in that in that way and and. and this is why I think the best businesses are built over such a long time because they just develop this 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 understanding within the institution of like okay here's how we do things here's what our customers are here's how we help them that doesn't happen overnight so the kind of the longer that you're doing it the easier it gets yeah let's talk about the offer though yeah so um, when it comes to your website I can only buy one product but you've actually got loads of products yeah talk to me about that right so this is kind of an extension of the idea of the, of crafting the magic okay your usp so for us and it, it obviously i have to use storyline to give the example yeah. here, so it sounds like uh if it sounds too much like a sales pitch you're you're no but it's in. super useful like this is this is an actual business like this is an actual example yeah. of something that works and I think it's really interesting. Yeah, it's easiest for me to kind of to use yeah. story learning as the case study because that's you know that that's what's most available. So, it, so in our case, 
we're doing something a bit different, right? We're saying learn languages through stories. So what that means is when someone comes to our website, we don't then want to present them with a million different options for doing that. Because how are they supposed to know? This is something new. Um, these products presumably all do different things. If someone has come, as, has come so far as to say, watch a video on YouTube, read a book, and they've come to our website, they're now interested. We want to make it as simple as possible for them to take the next step. So the question is, right, if we're positioning the business for growth, then we need to orientate the website towards new visitors, people that don't necessarily know what we do. So they land on the website, your copy needs to make it very clear that they're in the right place, what it is that you do. And then there should be one step that you take if you want to, to learn with us. And so that's why there's only one product available per, per language. We have different languages of so different products, but within one language, there's only one product available. And that is the, the most kind of basic and obvious offer, which is, let's say you want to learn French. Okay, here is the course to learn French. So we're speaking in very, very basic terms. You want to learn French? Okay, cool, here's the course. Because the conversation that's going on in the mind of the, of the, of the visitor is, I'd quite like to learn French. What have you got? Mm. That? Okay, cool. Now, we have all kinds of other products that we, that, we, that we have to help you learn French, whether it's to practice your pronunciation, to practice your grammar. But if all of that stuff is available on the front end, that gives you the paradox of choice. And you're not really sure what's best. So now then you email us and say, oh, I can see all these courses you've got. You know, which one's best for me? And we used to get this all the time. Like, what should I, what should I do? So there came a time when I said, right, listen, we're going to cut it all out. Have one thing. And then if, you, if you're clear about your, your USP and the, and, and the offer, the value proposition of your business, then you can design a straight line from the organic content that's out there attracting people through to the website, through to the product, and then what happens you know, after that. So at every step, we're trying to make, to craft the most logical next step and give very, very few choices about, about what to do. So that's the, the ethos behind that. Yeah, it's really, really cool. And I think the interesting thing is then those people, they enter your, your email list yeah. where you provide them content on learning languages. Yeah. But then you also regularly present them offers. So once they maybe, if they've either purchased the first product or not purchased the first product. Which is most people, by yeah. the way. Yeah. yeah, so most people don't purchase that yeah. product. They just come into the email list. Yeah. How do you then, how do you think about that then selling to those people? Yeah, so we, we start with the idea that, hey, maybe they're just not ready yet. Yeah. Which is, again, it's most people. You know, like I mentioned the, the course to, um, to for my private pilot license i need to i've got an air law exam i have to take and i've known this for six months and i bought these books but i hate them they're dull as dishwater i need an online course that's going to just put me through my paces and get me ready for the exam mm. why haven't i done it yet because i'm human yeah right and so if if i'd gone to a website and they tried to sort of sell me on day one when i first visited the website in february this year or something six months ago all they had to do was wait. Yeah. Right. So let's say that I'd gone there and they, they got my email address. They didn't because they're not very good. Let's say they had. Mm. I would probably have been reading their emails with great interest over the last six months. Right. Let's say then that they, they say, right, it's uh, September, back to school. Isn't it time to get that air law exam done? And I said, yeah, it probably is. And here's an offer for, your, uh, for, for our, our flagship air law um, course. And if you join this week as a back-to-school bonus, we've got a set of, I don't know, exam questions to help you practice. I'd be like, let's do it. And so it's, it's, about, it's about understanding the journey that the customer's going on. And then as time passes, creating opportunities for people who will be ready at different points to then come into your world. And you've got to remember that there's like a, always a huge risk with these kind of conversations that it sounds very sort of capitalist and, and marketing and, and, and sales and all of that. But if you're doing something that's, that's doing a service for people, you are providing them a service by making these offers available. Because if I'm going to fail my air law exam, yeah. if I don't get across the health, like <laughs> literally, so you're not doing any, you're not doing any favors 
by holding your thing back behind some behind some barrier you, like to to sell this course to me is to help me yeah and so once you i think once you realize that then you kind of give yourself permission to say right well we've got these people who are all on different stages of their journey it's incumbent on us then to help them at different points and that can mean making offers a lot more regularly than you might initially be comfortable with you know so a story learning we make two offers a month yeah. now they don't all go out to everybody we if you bought something you won't get an offer for that again if you had something two weeks ago you won't get another because mm -hmm. we, we segment and tag properly but we do a lot of offers because people are at different stages and they need help at different times and that's just good business um but yeah like everything else it took us a long time to uh, to realize that yeah how do you how do you sell in those emails? Are they like an email explicitly selling a product, or are they like here's some content about um, this language, and then at the bottom there's an offer? Depends. So, uh, for example, you know if it's a, if, if we're in Black Friday and there's a lot of noise, then um, we might actually that's probably not the best example. So. The best way to describe this is that our modus operandi all the time is to provide great content. So it's actually a mistake then if you're if you've got an offer available to hide it behind various various uh, you know various doors yeah. that have to be opened. Again, to go back to that to the to the the the, the exam uh, example, like so, let's say I've been consuming these emails from from these from this from this flight school for six months super helpful really really cool nice emails videos whatever i'm busy i'm not on my email all the time i would actually quite appreciate a very explicit email saying we've got a special offer on our air law thing this week it ends on sunday so take action i again i appreciate that so over time we've actually got a lot more direct with the sales side of it mm. simply because it's couched among so much value in other ways. Where you get into trouble is, this happens a lot in e-commerce in particular, which is like you sign up for something and then you're just bombarded daily with 20% off, 100% off, summer sale, like, and it's, oh, come on. Yeah, it's, unsubscribe. There's, there's no value, unsubscribe, or else, man, I know I can get a 50% discount from you any day of the week, so yeah. why am I gonna buy today? Yeah. And then you've lost your, your, your trump card. Uh, so yeah, it's about mixing, understanding where you're at and then being fairly bold. At the How right do you time. think about uh, discounts? Discounts. So discounts. Uh, I am. I am. It's a very difficult subject. My starting point for discounts is that you should be able to sell your products for their value, not for the discount. So if you've got a strong USP, so in our case, you know, learn languages with stories. And you, and, and we get the right people to our website. They should want to do business with us because of what we have to offer, right? If you suddenly slap a discount on it, who do you get? You get reactive buyers, people mm. buying out of reactive consciousness. They're buying it because it's a deal, not because they actually want to invest in their own, uh, you know, learning their own their own development. Sure. So, fundamentally, with discounts, you're attracting the wrong people. Does that mean? This is again in the education context, right? Does that mean you should never do it? No, we, we do discount, but it's rare. And so when we do do it, like at Black Friday, for example, we usually offer a, a very good deal. So most of the time we don't discount. When we do, it's a serious discount. It's like legitimately good value because the rest of the year is expensive. And so it, it serves a purpose, which is to bring a lot of new customers into our world in one go, not leads or viewers, customers mm. in one go. And that has its own kind of knock-on effects, but it serves a purpose at certain points. But the, the key with, with discounting is to know why you're doing it. And the big thing to avoid, and so many people get trapped by this, is like that you cannot sell without using discounting. Mm. And you know, it's almost, I'd say like 90% of e-commerce brands have this problem. The only way they can shift stuff is by discounting. And, and then you just lose, your entire positioning against your competitor who has a slightly better product. Yeah. 
So in education, um, what are the, in terms of like laying out the, the, the products that you might create, especially around courses, you would have like a French level one, level two, level three, level four that you can progress through. Yeah. And then I think you also do like monthly challenges. Yeah. So we, we have lots of stuff from like monthly challenges to, um, to kind of a hybrid continuity model to one-off courses to like very, very substantial certifications, but that's just our business. Like mm. there are many other ways of doing it. You know, I, I, I know businesses that, that have, you know, the membership sites that do, um, that do paid print newsletters that they send out in the, mm. in the mail every month, which is something I absolutely love. You can have like, uh, you have paid premium podcasts, you can have live cohorts, you can have like one-on-one -on -one consulting. There's loads and loads of different models mm. and every business needs a different, needs to design that for themselves. But how would you, how would you drive someone, make it compelling for them to purchase if you're not discounting? Is that where the kind of like the monthly challenge, like we've got Jan we've got a January challenge. Do you want to do right. this? Yeah. Uh, whereas the other stuff, I, I I I can see quite clearly is like level one, level two, level three, level four, and I'm progressing through that. Yeah. So I'll move through it, you know, as as I complete each stage. So the question is, how do you get people to to buy something if there's no if there's no discount? If there's no discount. So there's a few different ways to do it. But if you think about what a discount is, okay, yes, you're cutting the price, but you're also imposing a deadline. Mm. This discount lasts until Sunday at midnight. So what if you just swap out the discount and say, right, well, what else could end on Sunday at midnight? Bonuses. There's one easy way to do it. Nice. Add bonuses and say those bonuses disappear on Sunday uh, at midnight. Um, we could say, right, this with this, uh, for the next three months, you're going to get the course, but you're also going to get um, weekly support in a group call. But we start on Monday. So you've got to sign up by Sunday at midnight. Uh, what else can you do? You can you can create bundles, so you can say two for one. Classic, you know, every shop in every supermarket in the in the world does this two for one. You can use the same thing. Buy um, buy French level one, and you'll get French level two thrown in. The the key is there needs to be a deadline because otherwise human human beings don't don't take action. They they just wait until another time. Yeah. But the best, like my all time favorite way of of using this is I mean, this is known as urgency in the uh -huh. marketing world. Yeah. And um, my all-time favorite way of doing that is by having a natural deadline of some kind. So if you can make it so that your thing starts on Monday, the 1st of June, then people know they've got to buy by the day before, mm. right? And even then you'll get people buying on the 2nd and 3rd because they've just, they're catching up on their emails. But it's just natural deadlines are brilliant because you hardly have to sell it. You've got natural urgency. And again, in the education contest, it makes all the sense in the world because people kind of expect something to be time bound in some way. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's so helpful to anyone listening. Just the last part on offers. You mentioned people feel like, uh, can feel like they're selling themselves. They're selling yeah. out. My audience aren't going to buy it. They'll lose all respect for me. You've obviously gone through that. Yeah. How do you get over that feeling? By doing it, yeah. Basically, uh, it's also true that some audiences will bite your head off, yeah. and 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 uh, you know there are there are quite well known recent stories. You might be aware of them. Of uh, yeah, know, Yes Theory in particular. That's what I was thinking of. Um, you know, so big YouTube brand sells the first first ever thing. It's a, it's a course. Turns out that the entire audience of however how many millions of people they built were only following them for the for the fun. They don't want to buy anything. Yeah. Um, so it it can be the case that you can build the wrong audience. This is why when it comes to to, to, to building a business, it's not just the product. You've got to think, hey, how do I get the right people in to that product in the first place? So this, this whole idea of audience and generating the right audience is absolutely key. So we, we kind of have to assume that you're getting the right people through. If you're not, that's the problem to fix. You know, so for example, if you if you so we don't do anything on TikTok. Why? Because on the whole, people who are scrolling TikTok are not the dedicated learners that we're looking for. I'd rather get them from YouTube or, or a blog, right? So you've got to, got to take that into account. Um, but once I think you realize that the stuff that you're creating and selling is genuinely helping people, 
then you kind of have a reckoning moment where you think, well, do I want to help people or not? And you realize that it's often the best way to help someone is by selling them something. If this air law exam again, if you gave me a great thing here, a book for free, I'd never look at it because mm. I haven't invested anything in it mm. emotionally or, yeah. or financially or whatever. I, I'm the kind of person that I have to enroll in something, buy something, pay for it in order to take it seriously. Yeah. There are people that don't. And, and, and then so it can, and you know, you might not be like that, right? So you can kind of think to yourself, well, I would just do it without paying. So why should I charge someone? I think it comes down to understanding people and understanding what they value and what they want. And, you know, to kind of caricature it a bit, the whole business model of online education essentially is that you teach everything you know for free and then you sell the structured version. Because if I want to learn something, I don't want to sort through your YouTube videos. I want to have it all packaged together. So that's kind of what you do. It's all available out, out there, mm. but people pay for the organization and the structure. So, you know, once you've got once you've got a you know a few hundred customers who email you in, like this guy Robert emailed me and sent me a picture of him and, and this woman. I said, oh, who's that? And he said, this is, a, this is a Colombian woman that I just got married to in Bogota last week. Uh, we only speak in Spanish and we can only do this because of, because of your, yeah. your product. And you think, wow. What if I never sold him that product? Yeah, unbelievable. And so you start to collect these stories and then again, like with enough time, you just, you just, you just know. Yeah, yeah. Um... Let's talk about that. I would just say, side note, I, I, in a previous life, I worked at a cohort-based course company. Okay. And we would sell high-ticket cohort-based courses, $2,000, $5,000, $10,000. And we did cohort analysis on the people we discounted to. The, yeah, they never passed. They never, they, they never turned up to yeah. most of the stuff because they didn't value it. Whereas these people who'd spent $2,000, $5,000, $10,000, you bet they turned up. You bet they followed through. Yeah. You bet they, they made the most and asked all, asked all the questions. And you've got to remember, people pay ten twenty thousand 20000 for a master's degree, which arguably does very little for your career, yeah. certainly financially anyway. Yeah. I mean, you, you might need it for that, that job, that job promotion. Um, people pay 50, 100 grand for an MBA, 200 grand to go to Harvard. The ROI on those things is not clear at all. Mm. But, 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 you know, with, um, with other things, it is. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, it's all relative. So let's talk about how do you build the right type of audience? You've got 360 plus thousand on YouTube. How, how, many, are, how many are on um, your email list and blog? And I mean, we, have, we have over a million visitors a month on the blog. We have po podcasts with millions of downloads a month. Um, yeah, it's a lot. It's a big audience. So you must be doing something right with content. Yeah. And as you say, building the right audience, the right type of audience. How do you, how do you approach that? What are the biggest lessons? So lesson number one is get started and don't stop. So building any kind of content, okay, that, that you will hear stories of the people who made three YouTube videos and just exploded. That's not normal. Uh -huh. And you've got to kind of look past that. Most people that do, that do really well, they, they, they get started, they do it as a hobby. Because it's a hobby, they keep it up for two, three years, long enough to get traction. And then one day they think, oh, look at that, I've got some traction. And they, they double down and they build the, they build the business. Most traffic sources, content platforms take years to build and consistency is the name of the game. So it's about publishing one video a week, one blog post a week, one uh, you know, uh, podcast a week and, and not stopping. And you've got to have faith in the process. So nothing works, whatever else happens, nothing works without that. So that's just like table stakes, right? Beyond that then, the question is, well, how do we, how do we know that the kind of people who do find our stuff will be the people who will then want to go and buy. And so it's very dependent on, on, on the niche. But the way that I think about this is, what is our USP? What is the DNA of the brand? What is our, our magic? And how do we convey that in our content? So when I'm making YouTube videos, we tell stories of languages and wh where they came from. If we're writing um, blog posts, we might tell the story of someone who who did? Um, who went to the U.S. military language training program? If we're on a podcast, I might interview someone that tells the story of how they learned Spanish or whatever. And so we kind of bake our USP into this content. It's quite difficult for someone to follow you, to subscribe to you, 
whatever, to continue consuming your content and to have no interest in what it is that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think where people will get into most trouble will be with entertainment type content. This is your kind of yes theories of the world, right? So it's like, and this is, YouTube is a is danger area for this because mm -hmm. so many people, because the way to get huge on YouTube generally is entertain people. Yeah. Because that's how you go viral. That's how you explode. Yeah. But none of that necessarily converts into into buyers. Yeah. So so yes, you got to entertain, but you also got to um, you've also got to got to teach. So I like to think of it as entertainment. So you're educating people and uh, teaching them at the same time. Yeah, sorry, educating them and uh, entertaining them at the same time. You've got to make it make it fun. But if you are, uh, you know, if you're creating content that's genuinely helpful for people who are trying to solve a problem, it's the most natural thing then for them to want to consume your stuff. Again, it won't be everybody. Ninety-five plus percent of people will never buy anything from you. Yeah. But you don't need them to because five percent is, is 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 more than enough. Yeah. Uh, a very similar approach to. Um... We spoke to Ali Abdal's manager, and it's it's the same. It's like give away night, give it give away everything for free. Yeah, five percent will buy, three yep. percent will buy. Yeah, and that will pay for for, for for everything. It's quite a benevolent business model, really, because it means most people get everything for free, <laughs> yeah. and the people who want to pay for structure can, and everyone's happy. Yeah, how do you come up with good content ideas? So this is very. It's, this is something you really got to nurture over time, and it's very platform dependent. So. Mm -hmm. The thought that you would put into, you know, who to, uh, I mean, obviously with guests like this, you put huge amounts of thought into who you're going <laughs> yeah. to have on, yeah. but um, or none, as the case may be. But um, <laughs> but you know, every different platform has its own set of criteria as to what grows, right? So so if you're if you are building a blog, mm. you've um, you've got to learn the craft of blogging. You've got to learn what how Google works how to get traffic from Google, how to, how to um, do on-page and off-page off SEO. If you're building a YouTube channel, you've got to study the algorithm. You've got to learn from other YouTubers. So there's a Venn diagram, really, between the content you want to create in your USP and then what works on that particular platform. And really, the sweet spot is right in between mm. there. You can't do it. Like, if you do it just with algorithm-based stuff, you won't attract any customers. It'll all be, uh, you know, drive-bys, yeah. as they say. As they, as they say. Um, and if you do just the kind of content that you want to create, you won't get any traction. So it'll be, you get a small number of very, very dedicated people, but you just won't get any exposure because the algorithm doesn't like what you're doing. Mm. So you've got to do both. So the way that I've always approached this is like build one content platform at a time. Master it. Your, I, I'm a big proponent of the founder mastering each content platform that, that, they, that they do, right? So I started with a blog. Then I moved on to a podcast. Then I moved on to YouTube, and every time that I've done it, I've set my. I started the year by saying, "Right, this is the year of YouTube." Mm -hmm. Twenty twenty one, I started. I was going to learn YouTube this year, and because no one else is ever going to care as much about your content as you will. Yeah, you can find good people, but no one's going to care as much as you, and no one's going to have that magic spark that you started the business with in the first place, right? So it's a continuation of that spark you've got into the content. And then figuring out how to make that work on the various algorithms. That's your that's your gold dust right there. So you figure out, you take responsibility for, for, for learning that platform yourself. And then once you feel like you've cracked it, once you've got traction, you codify it, you systematize it, and then you bring on other people who can continue that once you've actually got, got it all worked out. That's when you can then move on to the next platform and the next challenge. So like that's how I always suggest people do it. And, uh, you know, if you've got very, very deep pockets, you can obviously get external teams to come in and do that. Yeah. But even then, I think it's, it's tricky to find someone who can really understand and, and portray your business the way that it needs to be. Yeah. I've got a friend who um, has blown up on uh, TikTok. He won't be grateful for you, for you saying that there's no one of value on, on TikTok. Maybe, <laughs> I, didn't, but, I didn't say there's uh, no one of value. But it wasn't for you. I said that... <laughs> Of all the different of all the different platforms out there, like where, so, so I mean, let's work through some interesting examples. Oh, well, was, well, the, the point I was going to make was the the one fundamental thing he says is that he posts every single TikTok himself because he yeah. needs to be there at the coal face, yeah. reading the comments, seeing the numbers, to 
like nail that as yeah. a platform and he he has he's 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 got i think 400,000 followers and millions of views a month for, on it yeah but i think that is it is so true if if you think you can just outsource it all to an to an agency or someone in the team you're not going to you're not going to have like real success there. yeah i think the cre- the creator world is is its own trap and i think a lot of a lot of creators in particular get to a point where they they realize, damn, like my whole, th- if, you, if, 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 if the algorithm hits my YouTube, we're screwed. Mm. So it's kind of, it, it, it's challenging to work, work back from that. In many ways, I think it's kind of easier to, to go the route that, that, that we have, which is that it's kind of business first, and then we add new media on top of that mm. as, as a way to, to, drive, to drive traffic, because we never make it all, all that, um, you know, all that, fo- all that founder focused on, on on me you know for the most part yeah um but but the, the content type is interesting because you know there's so many different options out there there's like there's, there's tiktok there's youtube podcast blog, all, all this all this different stuff email newsletters the right way to think about this usually is to think to yourself where is my customer likely to be and so in my in our case with 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 the language learning these are people who are who who like to spend time learning they they learn they spend a lot of time learning they're serious they're, they read books these are these types of people so then just intuitively if you ask them if you ask yourself well, where are they most likely the person like that you know coming home from work what are they most likely doing are they scrolling short form content on tiktok yeah are they watching youtube videos with their headphones in or are they reading a book or a newsletter and so for us it was very much the written side right the newsletter when we felt like that had got big enough what's next well, it's kind of probably podcast really because these people listen to longer form stuff and then from there is video short form video content nothing against it but it's the last thing that we would we would add yeah in our case that's another it's, a, it's such a good framework and it you you have to i think sit down and just think about this for an hour and i've heard the there's an amazing podcast called founders yeah by david semra so his ideal audience for that is founders of brilliant companies and probably startups mm. so he sits down and he thinks a podcast uh, yeah what's the best vehicle for that it's probably an audio podcast because our founders of successful companies are going to be sat down watching youtube or scrolling through tiktok yeah. or uh, looking at short form youtube shorts probably they're not yeah. they're probably going to be busy and they're going to be like on a plane headphones in, the gym. Headphones in headphones yeah. in the gym on yeah. a walk yeah. that's that's how they're going to consume or your they're content. in their inbox so an email newsletter is likely to fit quite well exactly yeah. so again like i think that's a really useful framework for, for 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 if you're if you're thinking what's the best uh, medium for my content yeah. um, it, just sit down and think how how are your audience going to consume this what have been your uh, hardest moments doing this it's all here, man. All here. Um, I, 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 I write a lot about this now because, because what's that? Is it Mark Twain? Everything's Mark Twain on the internet, isn't it? But like, uh, I had many, many problems, none of which ever actually happened. Yeah. Well, so some, some variation, of, yeah. some variation of that. I think that the, everything's been some, some version of, of that, you know, I look back at all the, various business problems, we haven't really had any in the sense that all we needed to do was give it a bit more time and keep, keep working the problem, as the Navy SEALs say. And, um, and you kind of, again, if you're not in too much of a rush, you figure stuff out eventually and you give it time. Where I've driven myself crazy is with, with mindset stuff. So it's kind of battling, battling ego, battling the, the kind of the need to, to grow faster, thinking, you know, why... Why aren't we? Why aren't we bigger? Oh, that guy over there's got more YouTube subscribers than me, and um, or or you know I want to I want to grow the team, but look, our profit margin shrunk to zero, and what does that say about me? I'm gonna you know be homeless under a bridge, and all these things. Your your mind kind of just you can just tells you all these stories, and uh, goes off on, on on all of its own tangents, usually because of our upbringing. And the way that we were we were brought up um, to think about to think about money, to think about success, to think about achievement, and so the biggest 
the biggest, biggest battle of all for me has all been around understanding my own psychology, my own mindset. And, um, you know, it's funny, earlier we talked about looking for, for, for green shoots and looking for your audience. I know on my business newsletter, when I write about this stuff, that's when I get all these floods of email replies. And so it just it so clearly resonates with so many people out there. But very few people talk about this, about, mm-hmm. about the sort of the mental side of stuff and managing managing your your ego and emotions and, and, and all it's like it's really difficult nobody talks about it and especially in kind of you know entrepreneurial business circles there aren't that many people doing that anyway at any at any scale so to find people at that kind of level who are also you know openly talking about these 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 things is pretty rare um so yeah that's been by far the biggest challenge can you give me an example of that i think one of the one of the the, the most confusing things for any entrepreneur to figure out is what am I actually trying to build? What am I actually doing this this for? Because the the popular narrative that's kind of anchored for everyone is Richard Branson and and, and Jeff Bezos, and and if you're not careful, you can kind of sleepwalk into this this unexamined assumption that unless you're a billionaire, you haven't made it. That's an extreme example, mm. but then. The, the reality of, of of starting a business as an entrepreneur is you've got to work damn hard. You basically you your business and your life become synonymous as you are as you're building your business. Like like I said, I've been doing this for ten years. Now I don't work much in my business anymore because I've managed to you know build it in such a way that I'm not involved in the day to day. But for the first you know eight seven eight years, I, I very much was. It was my life. I, you know. Family time, it's still on my mind. Mm. And so you, 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 you hustle from the beginning because it's your only, the only option you've, you've got. You, you know, I've got. I don't want to go back to Egypt. I've got, to, I've got to make this business work. So you hustle, you push hard. Here's what happens. No one ever tells you when it's time to stop. Yeah. Right? There's nobody that's going to say, you can stop making money now, it's all good. Or stop, stop, stop growing. No one says that. Basically, because it doesn't fly very well in the, uh, on, on Twitter. Or, or whatever, it's not a not a very sexy message. But in reality, that's an extremely important question as you're building because because if you keep pushing, if 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 nothing is ever enough for you, and you grow bigger and bigger and bigger, but you still want more and more and more, you, you know, you start to realize your life's going by, your kids are growing up, and if you haven't got a a, a, a properly worked out answer to that question, you wake up one morning and you think, like, I don't want to check my email today, I don't want to do this today, and I've been through periods of kind of burnout where it's not so much that I'm working too hard it's just I just don't know what the hell I'm doing and so I had to go through a, a period of uh, like you know a good couple of years or more two three years when I was asking myself like I've just been I've just been on autopilot for the last seven eight years what do I what do I actually want here you know and that's when I, I did a lot of reading um, reading people like Michael Singer really helped to just kind of just go center back on yourself and, re- and, and thinking what do I want from, from my life what do I want financially how much of this is ego how can I pass apart my ego from, from, from reality and just land on something that, that's authentically me and so and no one, no one teaches you this stuff like there's no manual for this which is kind of why I like to write about it so much because it's so, it's so damn difficult um, but yeah it's been a real real interesting thing to work out yeah and I think you've now arrived at a place where you've maybe thought a bit more about that and engineered a, a working um, environment and a team of people so that you're not like at it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I, ha- I have. I mean, th- although that is it's not necessarily the panacea that, you th- that, you, that, you, yeah. that it sounds because because having a bunch of free time is, and, and no, uh, no, nothing to fill that time with, uh, it, or, or kind of friends who are all working whilst you're sitting around at 11 in the morning is, uh, is not necessarily, again, something that you've planned and, and crafted, you know? So, um, so it's, it's like what, what I've realized recently for myself is that it's not for me, where I find my own personal fulfillment is not from subtraction, but from addition. Mm-hmm. So it's not from subtracting things. I, I, I went through a period of subtracting so much from my, from my work that I had nothing to do, mm. almost. That's not a happy place to be. Yeah. So I realized then by 
adding back the right things, which is a holistic thing across life from sort of health and, and nutrition to friends and community to travel to and business as well. I had to, I had to kind of deconstruct all of that and add back the, um, you know, the, the things that I'd figured out actually, yeah, here's how I want to spend my time. Uh, but yeah, but it, but it was a, it was a painful process and, uh, and I've ser I'm certainly like, I'm certainly further along than I was a few years ago for sure. Yeah. I think we're going to need to do another episode on that okay. and go a bit <laughs> deeper, but let's wrap up with some quick fire questions. Sure. Um, what gets you fired up? Potential. Best thing you've done with your money? Buy ourselves a family home in the country. Nice. Conversely, the worst thing? What a stupid car, and then sold it six months later. <laughs> what type of car? Uh, so, uh, I don't want to say. Okay. <laughs> um, Shouldn't have bought it. That, what, that, that is an example of where ego can take you. Yeah. And it shouldn't. Yeah. What are you optimizing for? Alignment. What does that mean? Alignment means between your business, your customers, and your and your yourself. Mentor of mine calls, calls this the, the, the harmony triangle. All of those things are working in such a way that it creates the best kind of energy. Nice. Best advice you ever received? When I first got started, I remember listening to a podcast and a guy called Chase said on this podcast, he said, if you just start a blog, stick at it for five years, you'll have a full-time income by the end of it. And he was damn right. Amazing. Yeah, definitely was right. Um, lastly, where can people find you? Uh, so our language business is at storylearning.com. And if you'd like to get on my business newsletter, it's at ollierichards.co. And I'm on all the socials. Amazing. There's so much we didn't get into, so we're going to have to do this again. Yeah. But Always thank you very much. Yeah, Absolutely you. loved it. Cheers. Nice one.